Hello, everybody. It's time to uh, start the next and actually the last uh, section of this conference. And um, it's uh, just one more minute, Bojan. It's, well, all right, now it turned to 15. OK. Yeah. Oh, man. It's according to my clock and my computer. It's, it's OK, it just now turned to 15, yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, I, um, I think that uh, it was quite relevant to organize, to arrange the um, order of appearance in this um, um, panel um, in a way that reflects the poetics of ascent. That is, I would like to start with the rising star in the Polish studies with Stanley uh, Bill, who is a uh, professor at Cambridge University and who uh, uh, you produced with Tomasz Bilczewski and Magdalena Popiel this absolutely terrific uh, Routledge World Companion to Polish literature. Many, many, many thanks, Stanley, for your efforts. I, I think this will be a, a very widely read book. Um, uh, just before you will talk about your strategies of uh, uh, translating and, and your experience, I uh, would like to uh, very briefly say what we expected actually from, uh, from this um, mm, discussion and, and the presentations. It's, it's, it's really a space of freedom of expression for you. You may um, uh, discuss your uh, experience, your uh, practice, uh, your uh, theoretical assumptions, if you have such, uh, in any way you wish. Uh, the point is really to have a multi-directional exchange uh, between you, the three of you, and uh, the audience, especially during the Q&P question. Um, so the next uh, on this ladder of ascent is um, Lillian Valley. And I just pulled from my, from my shelves. Um, I have three longish shelves with me, but I pulled this one because it's one of my favorite uh, poems by, uh, um, well, uh, books of poetry but Miłosz, by Miłosz, and it is wonderfully uh, translated by Lillian Valley, who I see, yes, is there. Thank you so much. And, um, and uh, the most seasoned uh, translator, also a friend of Miłosz, is um, Professor Robert Haas, uh, who is uh, a, a professor emeritus from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, well, that's what I uh, pulled from my shelf. It's uh, Sam Underwood, one of his uh, um, volumes, poetic volumes. Uh, and Second Space, New Poems, New Then. Uh, a work of collaboration between uh, Czesław Miłosz and Robert Haas. This is not the first time that uh, I will have this wonderful opportunity to, to, to hear Robert Haas uh, talking about uh, Czesław Miłosz and, and this uh, ever evolving um, uh, relationship. Uh, first time it was in the previous century at Indiana University in Bloomington where you probably don't remember uh, that invitation. I assume that you 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 very often uh, travel uh, across this uh, this continent. But it was a very uh, important um, uh, window into a sort of a translatorial intimacy. Uh, how this close connection between a translator and his poet uh, that usually we only see on paper how it can 
uh, uh, be uh, discussed as a certain um, intellectual and personal friendship. So uh, without a further ado, I, uh, uh, I think you, each of you has at least half an hour and then uh, the discussion will follow. And uh, Stanley, uh, you uh, may start. Well, Jenna, I just want to uh, clarify for a moment um, the format here. So Stanley will uh, speak first and um, Sasha will uh, respond. And then there will be some discussion with the audience. And then Lillian and I will respond. There will be some discussion with the audience. And then Robert, us, um, and you. Oh, and that's you to me. <laughs> Uh, I think we had, there was a miscommunication about, about who was uh, organized. Any, anyway, um, matter. thank you so uh, much. They've all been appraised of that format, so I don't want to throw a curveball at them and and, and throw yeah. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, so, so now Sasha, no now Stanley. Yes, yeah, Stanley, and then Sasha will will respond, and then you know we'll have a general discussion. So it's still you first, Sasha. It's Stanley. Sure. Thank you very much. It's a it's a real pleasure uh, to be here, uh, and it's a real privilege to be alongside uh, two translators uh, whose work I greatly admire, and thanks to whom uh, I first read Czesław Miłosz before I learned Polish um, many many years ago. Uh, so it's uh, I feel like my own uh, contribution uh, to the library of Miłosz's work uh, in English is extremely modest in comparison to what they have uh, contributed and the work that I translated this unfinished novel uh, the mountains of Parnassus is also uh, a very modest work uh, in comparison to the canonical works uh, of Chichabov Miłosz translated by Lillian and Robert and it, it is a kind of a footnote um, to that library of works that are now available in English and I think a place to start, and I will keep my remarks very brief so that we can then uh, inter, enter into discussion. Uh, the, the, the starting point for me was a, was a significant dilemma uh, as to whether to translate this work uh, when uh, the opportunity uh, to put my name forward as somebody to translate this came uh, through, through the publisher. Uh, and this work I was aware of had already been published in Polish. Um, but of course, it was a work that Miłosz did not uh, publish in his own lifetime. Uh, he sent it to his long-term collaborator, Jerzy Gedroitz, in, in, uh, in Paris for the Kultura um, publication to get his sense of it and whether the chapters of this book that he never finished, a science fiction novel, which might seem incongruous for Czesław Miłosz, were worth publishing more or less in the form in which we have them now. And uh, the response was lukewarm uh, from, from Gedroyz. And Miłosz in a letter seemed to be slightly offended by this and never returned to the idea of publishing it. So there's always a, a, a question about the legitimacy of publishing work that a writer did not publish in his own lifetime and did not have the opportunity to conduct any kind of final editorial work on. Uh, in his lifetime. And as a result, it is a work that is that is uneven. It has some sections that are um, up among the, you know, in the standard of, uh, of, of Miłosz's best writing. And it has some sections that are unsuccessful. And one can see what, what, where uh, Jerzy Gedroitz's uh, uh, skepticism might have come from. So it was a dilemma to me as to whether a work like this should appear uh, in English. Now, in, in, in the end, I decided it's already in, I succumbed to temptation on some level. Uh, and I decided that the work is already out there in Polish. The Miłosz estate has decided that it's fit to publish. Um, and uh, it had a relatively positive reception in its publication in Polish. And it does uh, shed some interesting new light as a curiosity, as a footnote for people who are very interested in Miłosz to see some of his constant obsessions approached through a very different genre uh, and from a, from a very different standpoint in a science, science fiction novel. And I think it is quite interesting in the way that uh, it does that. So the book it, in, in many ways grapples with some of the philosophical questions uh, about uh, religion in particular, about society, the direction that society is moving in California in particular, 
um, but he ties that to developments in Central and Eastern Europe uh, earlier in history um, that we find in Visions from San Francisco Bay, this collection of his essays, where he's dealing with a whole range of philosophical problems. Many of, and he's writing this, these uh, uh, um, chapters of the science fiction novel between 1967 and 1971, so in the same very similar period uh, in time where he's reflecting on these questions. So, so in the end, I'd, with, with, with some doubts and, and with some uh, never really dissolving the dilemma in my mind uh, of, of whether uh, this, this was a book that should be published, um, I ended up uh, uh, making the decision that that wasn't <laughs> my call to make um, and that I would succumb to the temptation uh, and, and take this opportunity that was presented to me to to translate the work of a, of a writer that I admired and loved. So that was the, the backstory, but it did mean, it did open up a certain set of, uh, of further dilemmas in the translation process itself, um, which a translator is always, um, is always uh, reflecting on to what degree uh, to, to naturalize a text, to what degree to change a text in subtle ways that might make it more accessible to readers or easier to read that might make certain sections um, that that seem awkward even in the original smoother there are always questions like that that a translator faces even when dealing with a with a great work uh, of literature that that sort of uh, uh, debate between fidelity whatever whatever that means and a kind of naturalness of expression um, in the target language and this seemed particularly uh, that was an even sharper um, a dilemma here because I was aware of the fact that some of the sections of the book were not Miwash's best writing. So then it opened up the question of, well, to what extent would I uh, take the opportunity to, to smooth out some things that seem to me to be, to be awkward? To what extent did I have the right to do that? <laughs> to what extent was that uh, a presumption on my part? And to what extent would, would, would that be perhaps what Miwash would want <laughs> if this work was actually to be published um, in English? I ended up not making very significant um, interventions in the text. I decided that this text ultimately is a kind of document, um, and, I, and I treated it as a, as a kind of marginal curios curiosity to Miwash's published work in English that would be above all of interest to people who were already well versed in Miwash and therefore would, would know what they were looking for in the work and, and take from it um, what, what, what I think it, it had to offer. Um, but I did have those questions alive in my mind uh, as I was uh, translating it. But I, I myself found that what was particularly interesting to me in this book um, is, is the question that I think runs through Miwash's uh, poetic career and his, uh, has, in his career as a thinker, which is his attitude to embodied life. Uh, and I raise this because I also uh, take the opportunity here to uh, which I warned uh, Bill uh, that I uh, Nicole that I that, that that I would do this, which is I have my my own book on Miwash coming out uh, soon, which is about the body, and this is a question Miwash and the body, and this is a question that I'm that I'm grappling with this in this book, and if you'll, I, I hope you'll excuse me for taking the opportunity to share this screen. The book's coming out later this year with Oxford University Press. Don't think there are going to be millions of readers, but some of them might be here. So therefore, I hope you do excuse me for for sharing this. But what's at the middle of, uh, of this book, and I think of Miwash's science fiction book, is this constant argument in his mind about the identity of a human being and the extent to which that identity is fundamentally embodied or disembodied. What is the relationship between the bodily and non-bodily parts of the human being? And he... he we see over the course of his career different perspectives in dialogue uh, on this question. We see, of course, his uh, Gnostic or Manichaean uh, dimension, which involves a kind of hatred of the flesh. And particularly, he talks about this as a kind of affliction of his younger uh, years uh, and an intellectual obsession uh, that we can find, and, and probably in works particularly in the earlier part of his career, but it continues throughout. And this sense of wishing to separate himself from everything earthly, and this involves the religious dimension of this kind of life, of this kind of idea, and everything fleshly. And then a corresponding and opposing idea, 
that involves an embrace of embodied life, an embrace of embodied life as the fundamental essence of humanity, of solidarity with other human beings, uh, but also as the path to a kind of renewed faith, that faith ultimately, as Miwash in certain places in his work seem to, seems to um, explain, is available through embodied existence, through the senses, through sensual experience, and that this is the path to a renewed faith. This question appears in a really interesting part of this book where there's a character called Lino Martinez, who is going on a, an interstellar voyage. He is a member in what is a kind of totalitarian society in, of the future of what's called the Astronauts Union, which seems to have some uh, relation to the elite uh, of uh, the, the elite of the party of the Soviet Union. And the astronauts have a kind of special set of sort of medical procedures done on them, which mean that they are effectively immortal and their bodies uh, are not subject to the same processes of aging and decay as the mere proles of the rest of the society. And this individual is proud of this identity, is part of this elite, but he reaches a crisis where he begins to doubt this and he begins to feel that this separation creates an, an emptiness um, in his life and that all he wants to do is return to earth, return to um, the people that he remembers from his youth, even though they have all aged while he has not, and they are these, he describes these sort of shriveled remnants of human beings that are, are contrasted with the, the, the physical health of his, own, uh, of his own body. And he decides to give up this membership of this, this elite that is essentially a kind of disembodied, almost sort of gnostic elite um, that, uh, that he belongs to and to re-embrace re uh, his existence as a, an embodied human being subject to death. Um, and that this is the only choice he can make. And so it's, it's quite interesting that this, this character in a way parallels some ideas that we find in, in other works um, by Miwash in, in some of his essays, uh, in some of his poems. Um, and as I said, it's a central dilemma that I'm concerned with uh, in, in the book that, that, that is coming out uh, in December. Um, and I found it, and, and in, it's also an interesting example of the ways in which translation work you know, often, often feeds into other kinds of thinking that we're doing. And some of those ideas that I was having for, for my work on that book really came out of the, the experience of, of translating this rather marginal work um, by, by Miwash and some of the ideas that I found in that. Can I interject, uh, Stanley, not to put you on the spot, but is there a passage um, that you could, if people have not yet um, read this book, just a brief passage? Yeah, I could, I could read a, uh, I could read a passage. There's another very interesting character who uh, expresses some of Miwash's ongoing concerns, and it's connected, connected to the, the same theme of em embodiment um, that I'm focusing on here. And embodied uh, religiosity in a way and a focus on the on it's, it's interesting that Muir seems to embrace a, a theory of secularization as de-ritualization um, that, that, we, that there are sociologists of religion present this theory it's an important idea to Charles Taylor in a secular age he talks about the secularization process is connected to a kind of disembodying of religion um, and, and a de-ritualizing religion of religion that comes with that. So this is a passage, I won't read too much of it, um, that is the last testament of a cardinal. It's the figure of a cardinal of the future who seems to be one of the last remaining representatives of a church that has been destroyed, that is no longer relevant to this sort of future society, which is kind of his extrapolation of California in a way, sort of into the into the, into the future. So I'll read a little bit of this uh, Cardinal's Testament. Yet today, when the edifice of two millennia has crumbled, we may see the consequences of the shame that induced us to reject the relative good simply because it was only relative. Naught but dust. Dust, the sumptuous draperies, gilding and marbles, and behind them the power and money of kings, princes, 
owners of the human flock, slave traders, pious tormentors of peasants. Dust the mitres and thrones and baldachines and sweet figurines of a pink baby Jesus and Madonnas clad in roses and collators pews and carved altars and all the countless Sundays when the sound of military trumpets rang out for the elevation and the cannons answered with a salvo from the walls. Ever at the gates of hell, choosing one thing or another from what was permitted, celebrate the holy day, do no harm to widows and orphans, perform penance for murder and adultery and tithes and fiefs and grand buildings and saving the souls of heter heretics by breaking their arms and legs on the wheel. Yet I took solace in what the church had once been since no purely human institution similarly depraved could have survived. And if history is so opaque and ambiguous that we can never establish the facts of the past, if everything that happened long ago stretches and contracts in the testimony as if in a multitude of distorted mirrors, then at least here we might find the one and only continuity in the vast archive gathered over the centuries, the one and only thread accessible to our understanding. And had it not been for the church, then where would they have crawled on the stumps of their limbs? Where would they have hobbled on their staffs and crutches? Where would they have wept tears to release them from silent torment? Certain, absolutely certain that every last day and hour would be weighed upon the scale and that for the saints on the icons, for the Jesus of wood and plaster, for the crowned virgin, they were more than merely a kneeling crowd, but rather individual men and women known by name from the days of their birth. While collaborating, yes, without doubt, in their oppression, the mother ecclesia guaranteed them there before the altar more than mere equality with the rich and powerful, but the majesty of a call addressed to them, the lowly. Just very briefly to, to continue, when he's talking about the reform of the liturgy, which is sort of echoing Vatican II, really, though it was supposed to extract the priest from this theater and bring him closer to the congregation of previously passive viewers, it only resulted in panic adding to the general panic that seized Christians when it was announced that the immutable and sacred had always been conventional and historical, and that now they would have to derive a newly conventional sacred for themselves. And here's Miłosz's vision of, of, of uh, secularization in a way, which echoes uh, Nietzsche's idea uh, of a kind of delay of the process, that the light of the stars, uh, as he says in the, mad, in the parable of the madman, is not yet seen. Things that have happened are not yet heard. Miwash's similar metaphor. So it had to be that a house already eaten from within by termites, but still covered in external splendor, lost its roof and walls, which collapsed in the attempt to replace a single beam, though it was not immediately apparent in the cloud of dust that the walls had gone. So there's this sense of the, the, the end of the ritual of the church, the embodied aspect of religion as being the doom of, of, of religion, the doom of the church. And then the, the hope that we get, uh, just to conclude, the hope that we get in a, a sort of very brief episode that may have been the direction in which this unfinished novel was supposed to be developed, is in a very small community of the surviving believers who are hiding out in the eponymous um, mountains of Parnassus and creating a new religious community based on a new embodied ritual that they create together, which is, a, which is about a, a community of religion, of embodied religion, based on the shared words uh, that, that then links this religion to Miwash's fundamental vocation, that of a, a wordsmith uh, and poet. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Bill. Um, you broke so many- Sorry, my, my name creates so many problems. That uh, my first name is actually Stanley. Bill, yeah. Bill is the surname. Dr. Bill. <laughs> it's a very understandable <laughs> mistake. Um, so you, uh, you mentioned a lot of different topics already, but I thought I'd um, ask you sort of if you wanted to expand a little bit more on the question of, um, this is a rare genre, of course, for 
for for Miwash, uh, science fiction, and uh, also the novel, although he did write other novels. Um, but uh, um, if you wanted to say something more about sort of what the the particularity of the science fiction novel allows him to do, which other perhaps genres uh, don't allow him to do, or what 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 he's able to come out of here. And also, if you wanted to, at the time, I think he also, or you, you mentioned this in your foreword as well, that so he wrote an essay on on science fiction at that period in time and talking about, um, and if you wanted to bring that in and talk about how that interplays uh, with, the, with the novel as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a difficult question. It's a, because it's a, it, it does seem incongruous in many ways for for Miwash to be writing a a, a science fiction novel. Um, I, I think the the best way to explain it, as far as I understand, it, is what I've hinted at already, which is that it it allows him to extrapolate from ideas that uh, he is working on and trends that he is noticing in, in his own time. So it, it science fiction, which is in many cases, and certainly in this case, about what things that will come to pass in the future, about imagining what direction society, human society, human technology uh, might develop in, right? It allows him uh, to, to conduct that experiment, right? And it allows him to imagine where the things that he is seeing around him in society, at its of the, the status of religion, the status of uh, belief, the status of poetry, um, the uh, what, what he sees as totalitarian um, uh, trends in in not just uh, the societies of Central and Eastern Europe, but also in different ways around him in in California, where they might get to. And and the and the genre and the and the generic conventions of science fiction allows him to do that. And then in in this in the essay that you're referring to, um, which which actually um, also is is about uh, Solovyov, uh, Vladimir Solovyov, who who uh, Lukash Tishno was talking about before, and and about the Antichrist, and it's about religious ideas in science fiction. And I think he there he draws out quite specifically why this is germane to his concerns, because it becomes a form of prophecy, it becomes a form of prophecy, and therefore it becomes a kind of scripture, scripture in the sense of, revel of the revelation, for instance, right, the revelation, which is written in the future, right, so in this essay, he is sort of, it describes the book of revelation almost as a kind of uh, science fiction work, right, imagining the future, right, that prophecy is an extrapolation of Things happening uh, around uh, in, in the in the society or in um, the divine history or or however it might be imagined uh, to to the future uh, and so in that way he imagines that science fiction has something in common with prophecy um, in a in a in a religious sense um, and in in those ways I think he ties uh, these together and that's why you know you have this figure of the of this cardinal um, in, in, this, uh, in this science fiction novel and, and many uh, religious concerns. And at the center of the novel is the question in a way of, of can religion and can religious faith and can a belief in immortality be in some way resuscitated and how, how is that possible? And we don't, he never finishes this, so we don't know the answer, but it seems seems to be that he would be moving in the direction of, first of all, a very small community, uh, isolated from uh, the rest of human society. And he always had this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, com sense in him of a, of, a, of a sort of temptation to sort of, there was a time where he almost went to a religious community in South, in the middle of the jungle of South America. Right? He very, he says this in one of his, in a few, of, in one of his autobiographical works that he, he, he came close, supposedly, to moving to this small community. So there's a sense of, of that there, but also the idea that it would be based on a reinvention of embodied ritual. Right, um, thank you. Um, perhaps it is because I myself work on Deep Katsu, but I could some feel that this novel also is, is um, in a way um, in conversation with another Polish science fiction novel, Insatiability. Uh, by Vipkatsu, who, who pops up here in some ways, and you can see some discussion with um, 
Mitkatsian um, historiography coming up here. I don't, I don't know if that's something you'd like to comment on. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure it's there in the background. I'm sure it is. But the, the, the style of these novels is, you know, so different that it would be very difficult to, uh, to compare them. And the, the novel, in a way, it never really takes flight. It becomes, it's, it's, uh, it's exposition. And I describe it in my introduction uh, as a kind of um, speculative world building. So he creates the world, he creates the background. He introduces some characters, but none of none of the characters. I mean, I think he says this at one point when he talks about the difficulties of a novel of the novel for him, and and one of those difficulties is he's, I, he doesn't he's not very good at least here or any other in any at building characters. You know, the characters are uh, are they're, they're at least in the sense if we're looking for uh, a kind of, uh, sort of fully formed uh, characters in a realist tradition, right? So the characters are. Are, are all um, versions, seem to be versions of himself. Um, if there, there are certainly episodes from his life that, 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 are, um, that are reproduced in the, uh, in the, in the biographies uh, of the characters. Um, and they are, they're somewhat flat on the page. They give, they give uh, exposition. They never seem like fully fleshed characters, which is something a little bit ironic in terms of what I've been saying before. Um, about uh, embodiment, but it, it, this is a, something that he's clearly grappling with here. I, I, I can't remember where, but I'm sure he says somewhere that he didn't didn't like really the process of uh, of building characters in that way in the in the in 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 the in the tradition of a realist novel, for example. So that feels like one of the things he's grappling with here and having trouble with is that the story he's building seems to demand um characters uh but that that's not something that that he wants to devote too much attention to all right and maybe um we'll open the floor to the uh, times running to to the audience in one second i'll ask maybe one more question i part of this novel has um as as he has elsewhere as well but has some criticism of um sort of um of formalization of, 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 of literature and art. And I find it sort of interesting how this novel itself can be almost read as a kind of postmodern work. If we, instead of reading it as unfinished, you read it as the as a novel that includes the concept of itself in some capacity. And, uh, yeah. and it's also at the same time as it's made in a period of time in which Miwash is, is struggling for a new sense of form. So those are, two strands that I had in mind. I'm not sure where the question comes yeah, from, but something you'd like to, um, yeah, develop. No, you're very right. You're very right about that. I think, I think the amorphous form here, um, and, and, and also perhaps the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't quite succeed, you know, is, is very much connected to the fact that this is a, this is a period of searching. This is, this is the, the, the period of the, uh, of the, the, the famous, uh, declaration from Ars Poetica, uh, of uh, of seeking a more capacious form um, uh, and seeking a form that would be neither prose or poetry. There are parts of this book uh, that were really enjoyable to translate as well, where he he um, he writes this mass, this liturgy, um, where you also see the influence of his biblical translations at the time and his attempt to find a language that's not too high but not too low, as he describes it. So it was enjoyable to try to um, reproduce that and find equivalent uh, biblical translations in English as models for the kind of things that he was writing, the kind of things that he was interested in. It's not that long before, you know, he's preparing himself in this period for what eventually comes in from the rising of the sun um, and what he describes himself as his magnum opus or certainly at least in the, in terms of those uh, searchings for a form and those experiments with form. So I think it's a really good way to understand this and and this book and to some extent I, I think if it doesn't if it if it doesn't quite succeed I think that that in a way makes it makes it even more interesting for us as as uh, readers of uh, Miwash trying to understand his process and the, and, and the way he was working through um, problems uh, in in constructing literature that would not be tied to specific genres uh, and, and forms. So it is, a, it is an interesting work in that way. I think he says himself that it is something of an experimental novel in its form. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously before postmodern novel really exists. Uh, that you alluded to it a little bit. Maybe I'll ask one more um, sort of question directly about the translation, just completely openly. What was there any 
what what parts of the project of translation were the most perhaps challenging or fun with this particular novel what if you wanted to say something about the, the it particular was, it, challenges yeah it was definitely the it was definitely the liturgy where, where i was just trying to find the the rhythms of the language that 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 he was finding like where there's a congregation and a deacon answering them so i've just read a couple of lines with the guy i go to this this is he's written this he's written this it's his own sort of liturgy but it's obviously based on on a, on a sort of catholic liturgy or on things the sort of things that are in a catholic liturgy. so I, I go to the altar of my god to the god who makes joyful my youth i shall praise you on the zither for you are my god why does my sorrow cease not and why do i live with the fear of death Lay your hope in God, for time shall be fulfilled, and you shall praise Him in the glory of your body. Um, so this is again this sort of, sort of these themes that I'm uh, emphasizing. It was really enjoyable actually doing that language and the kind of translation you do, where you sound, where you know you walk around with the phrases and uh, and sound them out um, in a way that was enjoyable. And this was really the only time, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Lillian and Robert in a moment. This was the only time where I was really translating something that was, uh, to some degree at least, Miwash's poetic work. And so I, I, can, I can only, so that was a taste of the kind of uh, pleasure that, uh, that Lillian and Robert um, uh, had over, over, the, over those years, I'm sure. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Stanley. And uh, I'd like to open the floor for uh, questions. <laughs> Right. Um, Hold on. I think Bojena is. You're muted, Bojena. Yeah. Uh, and so, in the passage that you read, uh, there was this uh, strang, very striking a set of images of crumbling statues. And uh, so, uh, I, I read it as a sort of a decay of representation, and uh, which allows him then to reach uh, the word. Uh, you know, through the cap with the capital W, but also it is, I think, a, um, a sort of an a, a iconoclastic um, attack of the very embodiment of a work of art. And um, so it again uh, connects uh, this passage with uh, with what you were talking about uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, so here is my, here is my question. Um, is it um, indeed for, you know, what you can just find out from this unfinished skeletal novel as you described it, is it indeed a, an iconoclastic attempt or is it just a brief passage in the, in the text? It is. It's a good question. I, I think it's. I think as always with Miwash, it's it's very paradoxical because on the one hand it is iconoclastic. You know, he doesn't doubt. He doesn't doubt the. I mean, the the. In some ways, he the the dis, the decay and the destruction is 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 real and legitimate. And this is an ex, this is an exposing of of the emptiness of form. Right of of form that 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 humans and artists reach to reach towards in different ways. Right, be it the the poetic word, be it the sculpture, be it the ritual, the ritual itself. Right, that is in some ways supposed to connect the embodied human with the above. Right, with the with the transcendent. Right, through through form. Right? But the but the falsity of that is exposed in this passage. On the one hand, right, it's exposed as just this material, this material, this matter that decays like all other matter, and and rots into the general storehouse of the earth's material, right, that is constantly transformed and renewed in different forms. But on the other hand, there's the sense that, but there's nothing else, that, that there isn't, that, that, that there's no alternative but to to keep striving for these forms, to, to, to create them anew and to, and to find meaning in them. And that therefore, 
what he's describing, what he's understanding as the the church, and he refers directly to John the Twenty Third and to uh, Aggiornamento and to Vatican II. That this sort of questioning of forms and attempt to get closer to people is ultimately uh, counterproductive, because although yes, they are empty and and artificial and conventional, um, striving for them is is all that is all that uh, that artists and and humans can do. I mean, just to conclude, there's I always love this poem, "Sense a Meaning" uh, by Miwash, which describes. This word, this word that in it, where in, in a world where there is nothing except this world, that's what Miwash says, right? There is nothing but the material things of this world. And yet there is the word, the word survives. And it, and it strives out into the universe, screaming, crying out for, for meaning, essentially. Robert, I'm sure you can, you can recite <laughs> it for us, but it's a wonderful poem and that that sort of sense, uh, I think, comes through here. So maybe after all, terms forms are empty, but there's nothing but form, and that, yeah. because that is that is the only that is the only way humans can have meaning is by. Yeah, that maybe translating this novel as a document, as you as you said, was not after all a risky uh, gesture. Uh, and look, we had a very interesting exchange here. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think um, Wukash has a, has a question. <laughs> yes, uh, well, it was very interesting what you commented on this uh, Guru Parnasu. And uh, well, I would like you to tell something more about the uh, nature of the rituals, which are uh, well, shown in, 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 in this novel, because I think that it, it, it's quite striking that, if I remember it well, the rituals are not rituals of fertility, uh, but these are rituals more of, I would say, celebration and knowledge and, uh, well, purity of the gestures that should remain in this, well, crippled and, and somehow damned world. Uh, and uh, I remember once we discussed this, uh, essay, if only this could be said by, by Miłosz, and it is there where he points to that uh, the most, well, vital rituals in our world are rituals of fertility or rituals of life, but here the rituals are much more connected with knowledge and, well, well purity of, uh, I don't know, space that should be somehow uh, well, distanced from the crippled world. So that's my question. To some extent, yes, but but also also not. I mean, also the, they really emphasize the uh, the physicality again. So there is this strange sermon that is in rhythmical speech. He describes as being rhythmical speech. It's also really hard to uh, to translate. Um, and I, I tried to, uh, to, to, to make it somewhat rhythmical, but, but it says, for you and I repeat the words to ourselves, I am, I am here, my hand, my knee, my face, so familiar to the touch, my face from reflections in mirrors and the eyes of people, my hunger, my bodily greed, my tears, my weariness. These are the, these are the words of, that are being recited in this ritual. Um, so, so it very much kind of uh, emphasizes uh, the, the being here uh, of the body and in, in all of its uh, impoverished uh, reality, right, as you're, as, you're, as you're describing. So it's, I mean, it's such a difficult thing to talk about. And it's something that, you know, I grappled with in the, in, in the, in the book, um, in my own book. Is is this this paradox? So it's how it's somehow both how it's somehow both in the same at the same time, right? How it is a, it is a kind of striving for something through the body beyond the body, through through the body and through embodied existence, right? That there the higher realm is only accessible through sensual experience, not through the gnostic uh, rejection of uh, of sensual uh, experience. Um, so I, I don't know if that, I mean, your question is such a difficult one, Wukash, and we should um, talk about it at greater length in Krakow, and I hope we will meet before too long. 
um, over a beer or a coffee. Uh, but I hope I've gone some way to answering a little bit. I think that if I may just do Kash, add a sentence. It seems to me that uh, uh, Miłosz is trying to um, connect with, on the one hand, the tradition of initiation as embodied in Villa dei Misteri and uh, Roman frescoes. And on the other hand, uh, with the uh, tradition of uh, Villa dei Misteri as uh, it was uh, invoked by Jerzy Nowosielski, uh, a very modernist uh, uh, painter, uh, Villa dei Misteri is a monumental work uh, Miłosz was, of course, uh, quite familiar with, with Nowosielski's paintings, but that's not really an issue here at all. The question is that both works uh, describe initiation into knowledge, but through the body. But Wukash, you're right. They're not fertility rituals. You're, you're, you're right about that. So if that, I mean, that, that your point there is correct, as far as I'm concerned. It's not that, it's not that kind of uh, ritual. But is it an initiation? I think on some level, yes. I think that's also right. I think that is right. I think on some level, yes. But above all, I think it's a forming of community. It's a kind of forming of community. And you know, this is in second space. In second space is that kind of uh, uh, attempt to return to, uh, it's a sort of uh, in humility returning to the, to the religion of community. Uh, away from this sort of rejection of that uh, as a primitive kind of uh, uh, set of ideas beneath the the, the intellectual um, uh, elite, and and that sort of idea is also in second space in some in some way. A, a attempt to return to to that kind of uh, that sort of ritual. Karina has written um, interesting things about this. Oh, thank you, uh, Stanley. Uh, yes, indeed, I had written something about it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's translated, but maybe in this uh, article there are some passages about it. Yeah. Uh, I just I'm sorry because uh, to be have been late for your speech, Stanley. Yet I now uh, hearing this excerpts of those uh, uh, litur liturgical texts. Uh, from uh, Mountain of Parnassus. I was thinking about Oscar Miłosz, <laughs> actually, as I just uh, have re 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 read some of him uh, pr to prepare myself for today. And this is very much similar for what Oscar Miłosz is saying about this uh, need for situating himself by, by the man, right? And it is also very physical, what he says. There is an, yeah, I see you not. So you probably remember how he uh, wrote, right, wrote very metaphysically about the blood, uh, how it's important, the rhythm of the blood circulating around the uh, human body. And also this gesture of looking at one's own hands to like mm, be aware of the relation between space and the one's own body and so on and so forth. So the question is, have you mentioned Oscar Miłosz and is, is he important for you? He is, he is important uh, in the general thinking that I'm doing about this, you know, Miłosz's uh, ideas of the body and the, and the blood in particular. So the, the early po poetry of Miłosz is full of these references to pulsating blood right? and the pulsating blood as the um, source of the self uh, in some way, and some, and but 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 with a mystical uh, significance uh, also, it's connecting it to some kind of higher reality. Um, so in this sense, yeah, I think Oscar Miłosz is very important. I hadn't thought about it with respect to the mountains of Parnassus specifically, but then that would tie what I was talking about before to Bojana's point about initi initiation um, uh, quite quite well, I think. We have any other questions? All right. Um, well, if we 
uh, don't have any other questions right now, I'd like to uh, thank Stanley and um, um, we'll move on to our to our next uh, next pair. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you also, Sasha. Thank you, Stanley. Um, yeah, I think Thank you. we will just Thanks, Sasha. we will turn things over directly to Lillian at this point, um, and then uh, lovely to have you here, Lillian. Thank you very much. I'm I'm very happy to be here, and I'm, I would like to thank Bill and uh, Esther and Matthew for making me visible here today. Mm -hmm. um, and special greetings to, to uh, Lukash and Renata and uh, Joanna. Um, those uh, are very special people to me, so I'm, I was happy to hear them uh, in their talks today. Um, I wanted to um, begin by answering Renata's question from her talk, and that was, you know, how does a uh, someone who's not Polish, a foreigner, deal with um, the, the Vilno and all the detailed information about the streets and the city um, in, in the text. What is the response of somebody who is not um, a native speaker of Polish? And so what I wanted to talk about today as a translator is the impact of um, working on the translations because I, I, I was by no means a full partner as a translator. I was in my early twenties and uh, as an act of generosity and trust, um, Czesław would invite students to help him with translating his work. And uh, that was the nature of the beginning of um, Bells in Winter. Um, and so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, because I think what, what I got out of working with Czesław for that brief time, because Bob is really the giant here of uh, translating Miłosz's poetry without any kind of a doubt. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was the kind of impact um, translating um, the poems about Vilnius and uh, the texture of nature in Miłosz's poetry, what I was able to pull out of that for myself to make sense of the world um, just as a human being uh, and how to proceed um, in life. If anyone out there is really interested in the complexity of um, uh, you know, the 10 year, almost the 10 years that um, I had contact with, with Miłosz um, as a student and as a translator. Uh, Cynthia Haven also did this other book and there's an essay in there called Seeing the Bear that explains that in great detail. But today I'm gonna limit myself, uh, first of all, to answering that question that Renata posed by reading a little bit of something that I wrote recently. Even though Miłosz wrote in Polish, at the core of his work was ethnic Lithuania. And I learned from my poet teacher about the primacy of attachment to place, what some have called geopiety, that is a profound and abiding respect and reverence for life, old knowledge, kinship with other living things, Informed regional loyalty could be a powerful antidote to blind and usually destructive nationalist, nationalist fevers. Possession of a historical sense and ecological literacy cultivated strength and rootedness in a diverse and rich biotic community and endowed one with the capacity to read landscapes and feel at home in them. His sensitivity to diverse peoples and life forms gave his work breath and lyrical power. My city in a valley among wooded hills under a fortified castle at the meeting of two rivers was famous for its ornate temples, churches, Catholic and Orthodox, synagogues and mosques. He wrote about the city of his youth, Vilno then, Vilnius now. And the power of encountering the city and all of its details uh, when we were doing these translations was so mighty 
that I went to the library and I wanted to find out, I wanted to find books on Vilnius. I wanted to read everything about Vilna. And at that time in the Doe Library uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, there were open stacks. And so I could go and there was a tremendous collection of works from interwar Poland that someone had sent uh, from Poland uh, for that collection. And I found photographs, uh, albums, guides to Vilna, and also photographs by Jan Buhak. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with that photography, but it was so, the uh, photographs were so evocative and just confirmed the power that I was finding uh, in the translations. And that catapulted me. Um, I was in Poland on a Fulbright it catapulted me to Vilnius, which was still um, on, you know, within the Soviet bloc. Um, and it was actually something that made uh, Chesla very unhappy that I had gone uh, during that time. Uh, but it was, a, and it was a life-changing experience. It was very difficult to get there. I was being obstructed at every point. Um, and I had some contacts there uh, that I had made in Poland and that were being made for me. So it was a very uh, revealing, um, very revealing journey. Uh, and I had this impression of Vilnius as a place that was a point of contact with the divine and, and the sacred because of the way it was in the, in the poetry. And when I got there, uh, it was, um, I guess I should quote Milos on that, but the holy had its abode only in denial. And so it was a very different experience once I went there. But I made contact with people who were very, very interesting, uh, and it led to an abiding interest uh, uh, in, in that region. But I wanted to talk about, um, I, I, I guess, um, I wanted to, to make a few remarks, and that is the difficulty of living imaginatively in a couple of places. It's almost as if you have to choose where you are going to live. And, and I was a child of, um, of immigrants, uh, part of that last million that left DPs that left Europe uh, in 1951. Um, and I grew up in Detroit. So Detroit was a fairly um, hospitable landscape as far as my parents' stories. So I, I grew up on stories of Poland uh, in Detroit, uh, in Michigan. We often traveled to Canada, a very, very similar landscape to maybe what I would have experienced if I had grown up in Poland. Uh, and then we moved to California. And once we moved to California, it was such an alien landscape to me. I was completely alienated from the landscape. I mean, I could appreciate the beauty of the beaches or, or the mountains or the bay, uh, but it was not a storied landscape for me the way um, Poland was a storied landscape for me, even though I wasn't experiencing it, it there, but, but through my parents' stories. Uh, so once I started working on the uh, translations, I feel that I got tools to uh, undo that alienation. And so I wanted to read, uh, I'm, I'm not going to read a lot, but I wanted to read this one section out of Bells and Winter. Uh, it's the Diary of a Naturalist. And all of these poems were uh, really formative uh, for me but I wanted to read um, the section that begins, everything would be fine if language did not deceive us by finding different names for the same thing in different times and places. <clears throat> the Alpine shooting star, Dodecathion alpinum, grows in the mountain woods over Rogue River. Which river in Southern Oregon, owing to its rocky, hardly accessible banks, is a river of fishermen and hunters. The black bear and the cougar are still relatively common on these slopes. The plant was named for its pink purple flowers, 
whose slanting tips point to the ground from under the petals and resembles a star from 19th century illustrations that falls pulling along a thief, thin sheaf of lines. The name was given to the river by French trappers when one of them stumbled into an Indian ambush. From that time on, they called it La Rivière des Coquins, the river of scoundrels or rogue in translation. I sat by its loud and foamy currents, tossing in pebbles and thinking that the name of that flower in the Indian language will never be known, no more than the native name of their river. A word should be contained in every single thing, but it is not. So what then of my vocation? And then he goes on to um, uh, construct what he calls a nonsensical stanza about Anusha and Jalia Rutale or green rue, always it seems a symbol of life and happiness. Why did Anusha grow that rue, that evergreen rue in her maiden's garden? And why did she sing of Jalia Rutale so that evening echoes carried over the water? And where did she go in her wreath of fresh rue? Did she take the skirt from her coffer when leaving? And who will know her in the Indian beyond when her name was Anusha? and she is no more. I think um, suddenly having this landscape, which is very close to Northern uh, California, there was something about working on, um, first of all, there was this tremendous inadequacy uh, that I felt uh, in terms of nature literacy. I did not, I could not match his language. I didn't have the knowledge about nature that he had, which was so specific. Um, and I sat over the Isa Valley with dictionaries day after day after day, trying to figure out what a capricale was or, you know, coots, all the creatures that I now know from living in the Central Valley, which is famous or was for its wetlands and still has quite a few. Um, so there was this, this sense of the inadequacy of being uh, a nature illiterate completely. Um, and I really think that British English is so much better at creating those correspondences than my certainly um, American English. Uh, so, so that was an education in itself acquiring um, <clears throat> a nature literacy, but in a region that had nothing to do with where, with where I lived. But it was an opening. It made me realize, number one, uh, the power of nature and the precision of it in his work. Uh, and also about these historical layers in the landscape. Um, early on, I think it was Alexandra who talked about um, the Euro, his Eurocentric approach to the landscape and to the denizens of the landscape. Um, the, the Indians are absolutely missing. The, the indigenous peoples are absolutely missing. And in this, in this particular section where it, he's not just naming the plant, but he's also saying, you know, the flower in the Indian language will never be known, made me realize that I could transfer what I was learning about Poland and Lithuania um, and the attempts at colonization, and then of course the um, you know the, the conquest and the, the movement of the boundaries back and forth, that that I could see that there had been similar struggles here, um, and it really opened up the, the historical layers of of uh, the poetry and the historical layers in California. Um, Let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Um, so uh, for me coming out of um, a culture in which I was living imaginatively in another country, uh, it allowed me to begin to live imaginatively 
in California. And, uh, and I even have gone back and have lived in Poland in the Polish-Lithuanian borderlands. And, uh, and I think I will always remain a kind of a cultural, bicultural schizophrenic. Um, but I think in the end, you have to choose where you're going to live imaginatively. Places live and die in the imagination. And I live in the place right now that is, I would say, on the moribund side. It, 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 there have to be these tremendous efforts to revive this part of California in the collective imagination. Um, but those are the, some of the things that I learned from uh, working on these uh, translations. So, uh, so I think that uh, it was the beginning of my interest in regionalism, bioregionalism, uh, not just politically, but environmentally. And um, it really has made a complete difference um, in the way I taught um, a kind of an inner, no matter what I was teaching, it was a kind of an interdisciplinary bioregionalist approach to, to it. Uh, and, and there was a tremendous fertility to that because the students that I have had to deal with um, for the most part are either from other places or have parents who are immigrants are from other places. And the one thing that we had in common was the place that was the unifying factor. Uh, and I thought that it always created magic in the, uh, in, in the classroom. So um, those are just some of the things that I wanted to say, but I also wanted to perhaps just read one more excerpt uh, from the diary of um, a naturalist. Um, again, I think the power uh, in Miwash's work uh, is, is definitely located in that, that core of geopiety towards his ethnic Lithuanian homeland uh, and in nature. And people are always arguing that, well, he, you know, there's all, all this information, all this carrying on about um, hostility to nature. And, um, but it, it, it seems to me that in the end, as a poet, that was where his power was. Um, in uh, the solace of nature, in the specificity of it, maybe because then you're able to embody yourself the, uh, uh, in a multiplicity of beings. Um, there's a density of being that you can assume. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to read <clears throat> is, um, just the first 12 lines of the Diary of a Naturalist. And I wanted to end by reading those in Polish um, so that you could get the meaning and then get some of the, the music of it. In search of a four leaf clover through the meadows at dawn, in search of a double hazelnut into deep forest, there we were promised a great, great life and it waited though we weren't yet born. The oak, our father, rough was his shoulder. Sister Birch led us with a whisper. Further and further we went on to meet the living water in which all strength revives. Until wandering through a dense black forest, all the long day of a young summer, we will come at dusk to the edge of bright waters where the king of beavers rules over the crossings. Farewell, nature. Farewell, nature. And I think um, it, it was it was Bob Haas who said that um, uh, Miwash was like an old growth forest. There were uh, there are many many layers of very ancient knowledge there, ideas about kinship and, and nature and the sacred, a kind of dispersed 
uh, sacred rather than one that's located in uh, in in, the, in one deity. Uh, here here's the Polish of that. Podstarolistną koniczynę łąkami po świecie, pod wyorzech głęboki las, tam wróżyło się nam wielkie życie i czekało, choć nie było nas. Dom nasz ojciec, szorskie jego ramię, siostra Brzoza szeptem prowadziła, coraz dalej szliśmy na spotkanie wody żywej z której wszelka siła. Aż wędrując głuchym, czarnym borem cały długi dzień młodego lata u wód jasnych staniemy wieczorem, gdzie król bobrów przeprawami włada. Żegnaj, przyrodo. Żegnaj, przyrodo. Thank you. Um, Don't want to put anyone into a poetic coma here. No, not at all. Not at all. More of a trance. Um, <laughs> I, I had, um, yeah, I had been looking at those uh, in, when we were putting together the reading yesterday. Uh, two of the sections you read uh, were, selections you read were on my short list. So I'm glad that you read them. Um, so I have just a, a couple of really um, kind of warm up questions. And um, the first one would, would really maybe connect to what Stanley was talking about, uh, this notion of some kind of uh, community uh, that he referred to. And I wondered if in a way, uh, one of the things that impressed me in reading Cynthia's account of your collaboration, and it sounds like I need to read the, the other book, there's more about that there, but it just struck me the, um, the nature of, of the engagement that it was really, uh, you felt definitely a kind of, uh, you, you were part of his experience and, and he was part of your experience and, and you were learning, um, you were you were finding things in his poetry that had meaning to you, and you know. And sometimes I think people imagine that um, that translation can be a kind of service, right, to to the original text that you know is just undertaken in in solitude. You know, Stanley now had to make some difficult decisions without having the opportunity to discuss I, 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 strategies. But, but but you were right there with him, and and more more than that, I you know you you mentioned that. You um, were working with him in a period when he was, you know, really struggling with doubt, and I was, was just a, really it impressed. was a horrible time. Yeah, he he had already sort of uh, consigned himself to oblivion. I mean, he was a, a crazily ambitious human being, and it seemed that that it was over for him. Well, at least that's when I walked into the picture that it was over. Uh, and my interest was, um, I had just completed a degree in English, and it, it, it didn't feel, my first language is not English, and it, it didn't feel like it was, except for maybe James Joyce and <laughs> some of the other Irish writers, that, that, it, that it was uh, as enriching. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to go back, I really wanted to explore um, Polish literature. So I came in a complete blank slate, I would say, as far as Polish literature went, and with, you know, a very, um, you know, the kind of Polish that you would speak when you cobble it together as a child, it, it, it I had to work very, very hard uh, for five years just to attain a degree of reading fluency so that I could read with as much pleasure as I did in English. So I was, I was coming in, I knew nothing about him, I was coming in because I wanted to study Polish literature and the bread riots had just happened and the actually the history of Polish literature had just come out and I had seen that. And um, those uh, 
tiny things together, not so tiny, the, the bread riots, but uh, raised my awareness. And, and, and I think we are sometimes as people, we're a culmination of yearning you know, that comes from other people. And I, I really felt like my dad really wanted to go back to Poland. And uh, somehow, um, I think my ending up going back there was was also a part of that. Like it was some culmination of, of familial uh, yearnings uh, because my parents never did go back. They never saw anybody from their family um, again. So, um, and I needed like an elder and, and it was an apprenticeship. And I, I think I regarded him as an elder. That's how I regarded him. And um, so it was, a, it was just a lot of learning. And the book that I really loved once I found out, I came across his name and the card index in the library and um, found his name and Oscar Milos's name. And I started to read because he never promoted himself to any of his students. Um, and I started to read Native Realm. And I think I read that book about 20 times. I would go to the stacks and read it and read it and read it, read it over again, looking, uh, I guess, you know, for, for some sort of geneal gene genealogy for myself, literary or otherwise. But um, I would not do my other work, but I would go and read Native, Native Realm all the time. Um, and so, and then he brought, he would bring in the work and, um, uh, and this is how it looked. Uh, I am not like a partner the way Bob would have been for him. He brought in, you know, a, a trot, just something that he did really fast. And then I would take it and, you know, put it into what I thought was closer to some sort of colloquial English. And then we would get together and work on it again. Um, but uh, what, what I learned was, um, you know, he, he knew what the contours were, the, the thought contours that he could put into language. I, I didn't know what those were. So I couldn't take the kind of liberties that he could take with the language. And, and I saw that, that it was just exactly like what um, Stanley said, that you, you have to learn um, what I think he, the word Stanley used was naturalize, you know, how to naturalize. Um, this idea or this thought or this uh, trope in, uh, in, in the other language. And so, um, and we would go back and forth and sometimes he would love what I did and sometimes he didn't. And he was, he was pretty, pretty hard. You know, he was a hard taskmaster. <laughs> you know, he would, he would tell you right up if he thought that was the worst thing that he'd ever seen. Uh, so, uh, um, but, but I learned a, a tremendous amount about that. And then um, he also had me translate uh, essays. And then there was a big volume of world literature today that resulted, uh, that was gonna to be to prepare for the Neustadt award that he got. And um, that was um, translating a lot of literary criticism. And so by then, that was about 1976. But by then um, I was getting the hang of it, I was getting the hang yeah, there were, I have to say there was just something reassuring somehow about reading that section just that that you and other translators were there for him and helped him make this yeah. very important step for him of, of finding you know this new broader audience that I think he always yeah. wanted to address. Yeah, he was very isolated, I think, and I think he was very trusting uh, in that in that way and and. Um, he shared a lot about his life, but but he thought he was completely done. He was defeated, and and I think a proof of it when when Bells in Winter, when it was ready as a manuscript, it was being sent out and it was being rejected. And he would show me the letters. He would say, "Look, you know, this is not going anywhere." Um, and he was he was really really disappointed. Um, and so then when Echo took bells in winter and then when he got the Nobel Prize and you know that was the, the little volume that was available in English because the other one was out of print uh, it was a nice vindication you know, for that. there's that nice picture of him you know uh, with the uh, you know Berkeley campus in the background and he's holding that volume 
Yeah, yeah, no, he was. The time when he won the prize. So um, I, I have some other questions that I can bring in, but I, I want to open things up to the audience and I want to begin. Um, Bojena mentioned that she had um, one of the photographs that she wanted to share. And I would also invite Bojena if she wants to kick off the um, audience part of the Q&A. Uh, Bojena, you're muted. <laughs> So and this is not just any any uh, photograph. It is the original um, of 1910 photograph by Jan Buha. Oh, uh, it's one, yeah, and it's one of the. Uh, of the it is. And now that you guys can see it, uh, so it's one of the earliest. Uh, as I said, it's the original. And so it's this flat landscape and, of course, uh, quite obligatory clouds, uh, which are, for him, a very important element of, of a poetic landscape. It's absolutely. As, as well. you, really, you really begin to understand that when you're in Vilnius. And actually, there is a photographer right now, Arunas Balkianas, who, uh, who, who does fantastic. Uh, photography of Vilnius. There's a whole core actually of wonderful Vilnius photographers. Uh, but uh, Buhak, um, um, well, this is not from New York, Vilnius. But, uh, this particular landscape is Polish. Uh huh. Uh, yes, yeah, he, he did a lot after the war in, in, in Poland. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but this is 1910. And his first photographs started in, uh, well, he started really to, to be a serious photographer in 1909, yeah. when his first photographs were published in, in Berlin. Um, but anyway, uh, this is just, you know. It, it's wonderful it, that you have it. It's wonderful that you have it because a lot of them were destroyed during the war. That's right. Uh, especially in Vilnius, they were destroyed, so. It was bombed, it, it was probably, his atelier was bound by the leaf. Yeah. Well, thank you. Other questions from the audience? Well, Borgena, if you have additional questions. No, I do not. There, there was one thing I wanted to add because there was that discussion, that comparison of Gombrowicz and Miłosz. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, Miwash's views on Blacks were brought up. There was that uh, essay that was not published in the English translation. And it, it was something that I had thought a lot about because I knew about that essay that had not been published. Um, and the question was, you know, is, is, was he a racist? Uh, <laughs> or, or he certainly would have been labeled that today. But in conversation with him, he would often say things I think that would would, would have been uh, censorable. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in his writing, I remember in Native Realm, uh, he was in Washington, D.C. at that time. And he, at that, at that time, he said that he thought that the Blacks were the only people who hadn't lost their souls. So I think he's always full, he's, he, he is a complex uh, human being uh, full of contradictions, just like the rest of us. Um, and uh, I, I think on that subject, it was one way and the other together. Um, Stanley. And it's a question of curiosity. It's perhaps something that uh, Robert Haas can talk about as well, is, uh, is how confident Miwash was in his uh, own instincts for the English language. So when you would have conversations, uh, I mean, I, I've had some experience of translating a living Polish author, and I know we have these conversations, and he has a strong sense of what he likes, but ultimately he will defer to... <laughs> The judgment of somebody whose native language is English. Um, it, it's even more intense of, a, of an issue with poetry. How, how did that tend to go and how, 
how did you, um, Lily in particular, that you describe yourself as being a, a young, very young person um, who was very much treating this, per this person as your elder and you were an apprentice. Um, what was the dynamic in terms of, did you, were there times where you thought his choice was just wrong and how, how were you able, how, how um, bold were you in, in, in pushing your uh, judgment uh, and how deferential would he be um, in view of the fact that, that, that it was a native language and he always said he would not write poetry directly in English um, because of that. So I'd be interested if you could say something about how that dynamic uh, worked. Uh, he, you know, he was very, um, he, he was not um, a rigid human being. So um, if he thought it was a good solution, uh, he, he would not, as a matter of fact, he would praise it uh and, and there there were a couple of times when he when he did say that you know that that that, that was a really good unraveling of a, of a of a problem um in that in that volume there's a section called um they're just these little sayings and i just took it upon myself to do them because they reminded me of Mitskevich, like there's danya nubagi and Mitskevich. Uh, it, it's the notes section in that and I did all those myself um, because I loved them. I just thought they were, I thought they were beautiful. And, and he just let, he left them alone. Uh, I, there may have been a couple of corrections of, of something he thought that was better, uh, but he did have a really good instinct for freshness and he would take it rough instead of facile. He, he, he liked the language to have some treads on it, I thought. Um, and so, but, but it was, it, you know, it wasn't a, a rigid, he, he wasn't rigid about it at all. So it was, it was a, a hospitable environment to work in, I thought, um, learned a lot. So, and I, and Bob can speak to that too, I think. Um, I wonder if you, um, could speak a little bit more. You mentioned the the Rogue River section in the uh -huh. in the interview you do with Cynthia and her book being particularly important to you, and maybe that might connect to what you were just saying um, about his you know blacks being the only people that hadn't lost their souls and that kind of um, engagement with re with America's troubled past um, that right. was referred to right. earlier. Well, I kept thinking when we were working on that, I kept thinking, I, I'm sure there is a word for that. I, I, you know, we just don't know it. That, that's, you know, our defect, not, not a defect of the language or uh, the, the fact that we, um, and you know, right now I'm, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, the Yokut's history in the, in the central Central Valley because it was it was wiped out quite quickly, but there's a lot of that language that exists, and so um, it it just made me think that that um, this wasn't where he lived imaginatively. I mean, he he had an eye for the beauty and the specificity of the language, but it was not where he lived imaginatively, and. Um, once that happens, I, I don't know how else to say it. You know, the spirits get a hold of you in a place. Uh, you know, once you root there, and um, uh, magic happens. All kinds of uh, wonderful things begin to happen um, to your understanding of a place and the plants and the animals and the relationships and the, and the human history there. Do you think he might have picked up on any of any interest in in particular elements of, of that through you and other people that he translated with? Yeah, he, in the in the last letter that he wrote to me, and I, I think it's at the Beinecke because I, I gave it to the Beinecke Library. In the last letter that he wrote to me, he wrote it was a very beautiful letter he, he wrote when he was um, he was visiting Shantimbrastis, uh, which is the the town. Um, where the graveyards are and um, for, for his family in ethnic Lithuania. 
And he said, I was on Magdalena's grave. Magdalena from the Isa Valley was a real person. And, and he said, I'm, only you will understand this because I love, that was the other book that I loved and read 20 times was the Isa Valley. And um, he said, only you will understand this. I went to visit Magdalena's grave. And, um, and then he went to Sweden and he went to Selma Lagerlöf's museum. And he said, you know, who would have thought? And then at the very end, he said, and the work that you're doing in the Central Valley um, may be the most important contribution of my work. In other words, if I could translate um, what he was doing in his poetry uh, into a way of living and understanding and, and, and being in a place, that 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 was important that was significant so yeah that was very heartening to get to get that letter that's just where i was trying to get to so that, to me that's <laughs> yeah. a perfect way to end but if, if other people have other questions um there's still space for that but yeah. i had this feeling that there was some something like yeah, that no, that's exactly yeah. that's that's exactly yeah. what you wrote so lucas is good, good evening. So my, my question would refer to the well, uh, well affinity and perhaps uh, respect between Gombrowicz and Miłosz. And uh, I know you 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 were also the translator of the of the uh, diary by by Gombrowicz. And uh, as far as I remember, it was uh, also Czesław Miłosz who suggested you to to do this great job. But uh, can you? Tell, tell, tell us something about the possible uh, impact uh, of Gombrowicz on Miłosz in his different views. For example, Alexandra Kremer earlier had this wonderful talk about the uh, well, tension between center and province. And it is also one of the greatest topics of uh, Vital Gombrowicz. Uh, another thing that comes to my mind is uh, um, Gombrowicz's view on the literature of the interwar period, uh, where he well commented on it in his diary, and I think that there is a big part of this uh, well position in the treatise on poetry by by Miłosz, and I think that he was to some extent uh, influenced by by Gombrowicz. So, so my question is, how can you comment being so close to Czesław Miłosz and also being uh, well, wonderful translator of Vital uh, Gombrowicz on this possible influence of uh, Gombrowicz to Miłosz. So I, I, I don't know if I can address that because I think Miłosz always said to me that they were quite different. That they were quite different. One of the things that he always said is that Gombrowicz had a better Kinderstube, you know, that he had a better upbringing than, than Miłosz did. Um, and, and I think um, Miłosz considered himself relatively poor all the time, somehow, you know, out of a, a, a different class. And um, he, to, to me, he was always emphasizing his difference uh, rather than, um, I, I think maybe one thing that I remember that he mentioned was, um, that uh, that that every poet should have a philosophy education, uh, and that he thought Gombrowicz that is something that Gombrowicz did. You know, he wrote that little book on you know philosophy according to Gombrowicz. But um, uh, but other than that, I I don't you know other than that um, philosophical disposition that that Polish literature didn't have enough of philosophical disposition, that that, that that was an area in which maybe Gombrowicz had, a, had an impact. But um, the diary was another one of those books like Miłosz's poetry that just, you know, ha had a tremendous impact on, on me as I, as I was, um, again, dealing with my own inadequacy as a translator because Gombrowicz is right at the top and it was, you, you really develop a complex about, about um, language and um, it re he really made you work hard. 
really made you work hard and and, and it's full of I, I feel that that translation is still full of all kinds of deficiencies but um, I just learned so much from Gombrowicz um, when he would let his guard down in that diary his um, the scenes where he's looking at a, a little child that, that put a stick through a, a candy wrapper and is singing to the stick and walking along. And he's in love with this child. And he was in love. He, he did, Gombrowicz did have an insight into the indigenous body. If you're talking about bodies here, um, the conquest of that body, the exploitation of that body, the, the, the indigenous body is something that keeps coming into his, his view. Um, maybe an area where Miłosz and Gombrowicz have a point of contact to is uh, maybe in the philosophy of pain. But, uh, and you see that all over Bells in Winter, but in, in uh, Gombrowicz, you know, you have that scene where he's on the beach and uh, there's been a wind and all these beetles have been overturned and he's and he starts to turn them back over so they can they can go off and he he starts and then he, he sees that the whole beach is covered with these beetles that are upside down and that he can't he can't write them all and how unfair you know when he stops that one beetle you know the next one how unfair it is that he can't turn that one over that that I think Gombrowicz maybe had a better sense of um, human limitations, human limitations to um, alleviate suffering. Um, uh, th those are the things that just come to mind right now. But, but what a great education uh, to translate the diary. That's what that was. Um, as has been every book that I've ever translated from the Polish, just a great education. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think on that wonderful note, um, we will conclude this portion. And uh, always in the back of my mind, I, I thought um, that we could take a, a short break here because a three hour session is uh, is long. So I'll just give everybody a few minutes to um, just to stretch and um, you know, get a glass of water. So we will start again at four o'clock with with Robert Haas.